qué, qué objetivo tienen, si da lo mismo la clasificación que tengan ya no va a, Champions, va a la Super Champions o a la Superliga van seguro. Se pierde el interés y el resto de clubes para acceder, pues que a lo mejor a través de la Liga Nacional accedes a una segunda división, pues igual hay una plaza. O, o, y luego tienes que jugar un playoff. Se pierde toda la esencia de lo que es la propia competición. A cualquiera de esos dos clubes españoles que estén allí, o tres, les dará lo mismo quedar en tu Liga Nacional el octavo, quedar el octavo porque vas a estar allí porque has mantenido tu categoría en esa primera división de la Superliga. ¿Cuál será el objetivo de esos equipos? Mantenerse en esa primera división. La Liga les dará lo mismo, o, o, o por el honor con sus aficionados podrá hacer, pero la, eh, la pérdida de atractivo audiovisual general, ta, es, estos de A22 que tanto hablan del interés y el atractivo será de, totalmente destruido. Totalmente destruido en la Liga Nacional. Y esto no solo va a pasar en la Liga Española, insisto, esto pasa en todas las ligas europeas. Pero las ligas nacionales ya llevamos 90 años con este sistema y hemos creado esta estructura de modelo que hay en la Liga Nacional. Si tú trasladas ese tipo de modelo a Europa, como ellos pretenden, vamos a ver las consecuencias, cómo destruyes toda esa industria que hemos hablado hace, en la semana anterior y hemos creado. ¿no? Y esto es importante saberlo, porque ellos se argumentan, no, es que en las ligas nacionales, pero perdón, en las ligas nacionales, bueno, algunas ya son, tienen más de, eh, más de 90 años. ¿no? Y, es, y el modelo dentro de las ligas nacionales ha funcionado y ha estado, y se ha creado muchísimas industrias en Europa dentro de las ligas nacionales de cada país. Ahora, si tú trasladas eso que se pretende trasladar a la Unión Europea por parte de la Superliga, lo que haces es trasladas mucho dinero allá arriba y destruyes mucho lo de abajo. Y te cargas, ya no solo a nivel todos los puestos de trabajo, te vas a cargar las aficiones y los clubes, y vamos a ver lo que va a pasar en ese ecosistema con los datos y con los números. ¿no? It's not, uh... Well, Project for Rich has got the richest clubs in Europe. I don't see any small clubs involved, but honestly, I don't like to be treated like a fool. I, that really annoys me. That's the worst thing. We know what's behind us, and we know what they think. Because I've sat many times with him, with Florentino. I mean, I haven't sat with him for over two years, but we've talked about football and European projects. and. He's been thinking the same thing since the year 2000. They want to rule over European football. And he said, don't worry about football. He'll be, you know, collecting all the revenue and he'll manage it. And that's what he said at the last assembly. And almost a spiritual tone that Real Madrid had the functional responsibility of protecting football. And that's what he believes. He's not going to fool us. So, of course, uh, they're the ones with the biggest um, assets. And when they start including other clubs, then we'll start talking. And then about meritocracy or sporting's merit. Unitativamente, la expresión meritocracia, para convencernos de algo que nos verdad. They're going to convince us about something that's not true. The project, it's... Sporting merit, it's not even light. It's something that is being imposed on. The fact that a very small number of clubs can access to play in the champions, that is not based on sporting merit. Transferring what's happening in the Spanish National League to the European League, that is not sporting league. The so-called sporting merit will have a destruction of all national leagues. That's what they need to be analyzing. So moving on to the next question, Silverstone from the BBC in the UK. We've repeatedly been told that the concept of Super League has been dead, but with this uh, conference, it's proving that it's not. Javier has mentioned this earlier, but if you'd like to clarify, please, what do you expect when the general attorney makes uh, public his ruling from the European Court on the 15th of December? Do you believe that the other 12 clubs that will withdraw uh, two days later will continue with this project? about this 
Super League being dead? Every time they've asked me, I've always said, no, it's not dead because it's a concept. It's not a competition format. It's a concept that's existed since the year 2000. I have always said that, and I keep repeating it. It's the concept that the richest clubs, the clubs with the most resources, are the ones that are going to control football. And this has been led by Florentino Perez since the year 2000. Nothing has changed since then. Even, even if they're not doing, they don't, go do well, they'll still have the same idea. Florentino will never lose. He's always going to try to achieve this because he's very persistent. As far as what we believe about this European Union Court of Justice lawyer, well, it's an opinion. It's non-binding for the courts, and very often it's been ignored. I hope that this ruling will recognize in to a great extent, the great work done by the UEFA in European football, and it's not a domineering position, and it's definitely not a monopoly. We've often said this, and we've discussed this with the UEFA, and the latest reforms they've carried out, both for financial control, which is very important, and also in, with regard to sports competitions regarding the champions, they've talked to the leagues, and we've reached agreements with them, which is what I've always defended. That's why La Liga has always said that we have to be on the same side as the UEFA. I don't care if we have, you know, two or five positions on the scoring of the UEFA. In the end, what really matters is reaching agreements with the UEFA, just like we've done now, to have European football properly organized and and it's definitely not from a position of abuse or dominion or monopoly. Obviously, this is just the opinion of a European lawyer. It's not binding. And as for the rest of your question, I don't think so. I think individually, there may always be the temptation. But many of the clubs that I've been able to talk to are very clear on the model and the path that European football uh, in the coming years of financial sustainability and the maintenance of competitiveness of the national uh, or domestic leagues, they all depend on this. Um, question in the room. A couple of questions from Sports Talk and Sports Cadi from India. I think they've already been answered. They were about how this would impact the broadcasting rights and audiences and then the sports merits, etc. So, hello, Andre Romero from El Mundo. For Javier, you've mentioned a concept in both uh, press conferences, which is the issue of governance. The first one of A22 didn't talk about format, but here you are. I have the impression, and I think the general opinion also has this impression, that this war that is supposedly exists, or the ongoing debate, is about who is in charge of European football. Because as far as the formats are concerned, the champions two years from now is going to change. It's going to be based on leagues. and then depending on what 822 will see how it changes. But I don't know if you also have the feeling that this is a matter of, it doesn't matter the format, even if the format were the same, the Super League uh, compared to the future champions format, or if it were very similar, the war would still continue. Uh, the discussion, the debate would still continue because it's a matter of knowing who's in charge in European football. Yes, I mentioned this earlier. The three points defended by A22 beyond competitiveness and governance, it's an issue of governance because they want to be in charge. They want to be in charge. And from that point on, they're going to come up with whatever competition format best meets their interests. And that's why now the discourse of A22 is that they have this format under the table. I am 100% sure they already know what the format is going to be. Otherwise, they would be absolute fools to be talking about European football and the fact that the champions is not ideal if they don't actually have thought about the solutions for all this. But they know that this discussion or this debate is detrimental for them because it goes against the domestic 
domestic leagues. And they keep saying, we're not going against the leagues. We're just going to let them have the weekends. Of course they're going against the leagues. We've already explained the impact, which they haven't. Obviously, it's an issue of governance, but it's very easy. We don't want to be governed by those with most resources. We don't want to football to be ruled by them because football is far more than the 20 richest teams in Europe. And that's not the governance model we want, and it's the one they want to impose. We like the models that we have in Spain, in La Liga, where the power is equally distributed across clubs, and we don't just do whatever the top clubs want. And in Europe, obviously, we need to have a more pan-European organization because there isn't a super state. Be so that's where the UEFA has to play this role, and they have to improve it, but not just to favor the large clubs so that they could be in charge, but rather to have an adequate balance. And I think little by little, UEFA, little by little, UEFA is taking steps in that direction. Now moving on to a question from an online Francisco Dominguez Heraldo in Mexico. How could the Super League model affect other continents? And also, how could it affect the things that like teams like the Chivas in Mexico can play friendly matches in Spain? Well, I don't like to talk about this as if we were in having a drink at a bar at 5 o'clock in the morning. I, we, we really need to analyze this. I haven't studied what would happen in other continents. And we'd be very happy to have these matches in Spain, of course. And now a question from the room. There were a couple of questions. Please give them the microphone over here. Go ahead. Hello, good morning. Javier Romero from El Economista. For Javier as well, I want to ask you, are you a little afraid that we're opening the door at the UEFA for negotiation? Because until now, they had always refused to meet with those leading the Super League. But now they've had that meeting, and now the CEO of this uh, A22, this Richard has already said that at least they're not going to be sanctioning the clubs. Are you afraid that they may be opening the possibility not to accept Super League, but at least to negotiate with them? But when I said that they haven't, they've achieved not sanctioning the clubs, it doesn't mean that they were talking to them. It's impossible. I think that was in something that was invented by the CEO of A22. I mean, clubs can talk with whomever they want to. They've never been sanctioned for that. But I think that's another communication strategy saying that the UEFA is an ogre, a monster. They don't want anybody to talk to anyone. If the CEO of the Super League wants to talk to me, of course I'll talk to him. And the UEFA has nothing to say about that. And as, are we open to negotiation? I don't think the UEFA is open to any negotiation because the league's open to talk to everyone. We talk to everyone. And one thing is to talk, and another thing is to negotiate. And to negotiate a model of competition and a governance, which means putting into the hands of a few with a lot of resources all of European football and a competition model that will ruin domestic leagues, that's not something that can be negotiated. Can you negotiate saying, OK, we're going to ruin you a little bit less? No, of course not. So I don't think that they're opening to negotiations. I was at Neon, and I did not have the impression that they were open to negotiations. And they also clarified certain positions, which I believe were very important, of A22 or the representing Super League and these other clubs. It was clear that the players in European football, the body where this structural reforms of Europe can be discussed, is that the UEFA, where again, Everything is discussed, and I've given you an example with financial control and the reform of the Champions League. Moving on. Another question from Emmy Garnet, Press Associated in the UK. Why should Real Madrid and Barcelona stop supporting Super League if they expect to win 400 euros more a year? How can we convince them not to continue? Well, in the midterm, they would lose. 
And just by looking at the last slide, what they're actually doing with revenue, they goes down. They're earning about 200 euro more, but the domestic leagues will lose. But the domestic league will continue uh, losing, and so they will be losing revenue in the domestic league. And the competition model, it might work the first three years as far as uh, broadcasting rights, but after the third or fourth year, it's value of their broadcasting rights will really drop. And once they realize that it's going to fall, that we will all be bankrupt, they and us. Question from the room. The, can you, uh, apologies, uh, one more thing. Real Madrid, Barcelona, they've been competing in the league for 90 years. 90 years competing. Osasuna, Valencia, Levante, Betty, Sevilla, Villarreal, small clubs. And they became big by competing in these competitions. So now trying to kick the rest in the ass, I don't think that's fair either. Because they are part of this growth because the competition has allowed them to become big clubs. Over here, President Elisa Lasso, La, Sofra, La Sexta. Have you considered the possibility of giving a green light to the Super League? Have you considered what measures would be taken from the UEFA or La Liga? I think 2019 was a good example when there was the agreement between ECA and the UEFA of the very similar model presented by Superliga under the table, not publicly, because now they're saying, no, 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 that wasn't the model. I don't know. They're going to pull out a rabbit from a hat or whatever. But by the way, they've been discussing this with even without the English clubs, because they know that would really be complicate matters. They're talking about a super league model that would be continental mainland without the English uh, clubs or teams. We would follow the same path. The domestic leagues also need to define what is going to be the future of European football and how European competitions are going to be carried out, because it's going to be affecting all domestic leagues. Definitely, that's the path. We're going to be continuing along and with the same strategy. And definitely, we're not just going to be idle. And we will, you know, won this battle in the past and we'll win it in the future, I'm sure. A question from Sports Kita in India like Ruben Binder from the UK, similar question. What do you think about this comment that's saying that football doesn't attract the younger generations? Oh, I could talk about this for hours. And I actually delivered a two-hour presentation on this in Monaco because it's all fake news. It's not true. It's not true. I'm always watching the way people's statements evolve. And A22 of the Super League started saying that young people are abandoning football. Now they're saying they're abandoning football, live football. And they keep, they keep qualifying things. And now it's going to be the most interesting matches so the young people will be more interested. They're no longer abandoning us. So there were specific facts and data from Price Waterhouse from 2021. The Z generation are watching football more than the millennial generation who are older. Of course, it's a different story how much they're willing to pay to watch. But there are real examples. We have a great digital ecosystem which shows us, we know the ages of between 14 to 22, they watch football more than they did in the past. But what does young mean from the age of five when they buy the football cards, so it's the way that children get interested in football, or when they're adolescents or teenagers or pre-teens when they start following a player. Kids from the age of 5 to 11 are fans of a player rather than a club. And then they start growing. And this has already been studied and analyzed. And it's quite the opposite. This is the period in time in history where young people are watching football most. It's the period of time with the 
largest number of audiovisual windows to watch football. The study by JFK Consulting says that football is the only sport that has grown in viewership among young people of all the major sports in the world. I would be delighted to give this pre presentation on this, but it's not true. What we need to be prepared for is that once these young people become financially independent, that's the key moment, because all of us young here today, when we were very young, they used to pay for us to go to football. And when pay television started, it was the family paying for that. And that's what we need to be paying attention, that transition when they become financially independent. And TikTok, what is most often watched on TikTok between the age of 12 and 24 is football, whether they're 20 or 30 second video clips, but they're based on football. So we have to be very, very prepared when they become financially independent. So when those young people become young adults, and then they can devote part of their own income to football. They're not abandoning us, not at all. It's the period of time when they're watching most football. But as those young people grow, and we sometimes forget that they will grow, they'll become adults, that's when we need to be paying attention to that transition when they then start paying to watch football. OK. Marcos Bernard from Cadena said, I have a question for Javier. Without getting into the different arguments of both sides, I would like to ask you about the relationship between La Liga and Barca and Madrid, because it's obvious that you have very uh, differing opinions about La Superliga, and also they're refusing to go to your General Assembly. It seems like you're constantly uh, dis arguing with them. So. How worried are you about the image of our football? Well, if having a better image means doing whatever they say that we have to do, well, then I'll keep this image. I mean, this is no uh, minor issues, the fact that we there are confrontations with the policies of Real Madrid and Barcelona. That's why we are the European country that best knows what the Super League really knows, because out of the three clubs left, two are from Spain. And I know what they think about La Liga and what they want from the competitions. I know perfectly well what their positions are. That's why whatever I say about Super League is has yeah, a solid grounds. And of course I'm angry, and of course I'm concerned, but I'm cons worried if they were something if we had made a mistake, but when you have 40 clubs traveling to Dubai, and 40 clubs are going to Dubai. Let's not forget about them. And Madrid Barcelona are not going? Well, I'm very sorry, but I don't read everything that comes out. But the press release that Real Madrid issues said that in these moments of financial crisis and so forth and so on, the agenda for Dubai is an agenda of investment where we're going to be generating. Don't forget that large clubs have a lot of possibilities of traveling and having contacts with a lot of companies, but the small and medium clubs, not quite so much. And the obligation of La Liga is to achieve and channel investments and so that these clubs at least network and hold work meetings with important companies around the world. And there are quite a lot of sponsors in Dubai right now because of the World Cup at very significant, interesting levels. And we need to be supporting that. I'm worried that they won't be there, but you know, not very much because there's this whole war of the Super League behind all this. And it's, it's all based on the governance model of football, both in Spain and across Europe. Of, very recently, we almost completely interrupted Spanish football because they changed a clause at the very last minute, which was a governance uh, model. And it was changed because of the pressure of the Real Madrid. And that's a fact. And you know, you think the image is bad? Well, I'm sorry if we're going to destroy football so as to we have a better image. Well, I'm sorry, I won't do that. We all, we all know what they're like and what the image of the Spanish football is like. Another question from the US, from CBS. Could the loss of value that you've mentioned of the clubs, 
Could it make La Liga bankrupt, especially after the pandemic? Also, he's asked about the possible punishments from La Liga to the clubs who will be participating in the European League. Do you want to make a clarification related to that? Well, the first one, as it's a scenario where well, I said they're not going to win. So I'm really clear they're not going to win because 40 clubs are against the Super League. So we're really going to go into battle, and um, we've been in this battle for years now based on these concepts where the wealthiest clubs want to govern us. But, so we are going to win this battle. So I don't even consider that scenario. We won once and we're going to win again. With regard to the clubs that are participating in the Super League, and are well, we going to punish them or sanction them? Well, well, it's something that we're not worrying about at the moment. We're not rushing into things about at the moment, considering all those things. But we want everyone to know that the Super League model can destroy the Spanish League and the economy of the different clubs, and also the attractiveness for our fans. Yes, sir. Hi, Mr. President. Luis Castro from Castilla-La Mancha. I wanted to ask you, in line with what you've already been saying, I would like to say, are you concerned about the message? Because you're saying they're not, you know, Super League's not going to win, but the message against the Super League on public opinion or for football fans. And certain, you know, declarations, for example, the UEFA is corrupt, you know, stealing their money, they're not allowed, you know, not sending their money to the clubs, or La Liga is making most of what's already been said in the assembly in Dubai and all the you know, press releases that are being issued by this club. So are you worried about all this, that the whole story related to this or the message that's coming out in seems that is it being lost by the UEFA and the National Leagues and the Super League are winning? Well, I don't know who's giving these messages out, but I think there's a lot of, you know, toxic comments. You know, I don't know if you saw the the A22 when they were talking about their, the f well, he was actually on the television in Puente Pretina in Chiringuito and the Cadena Sea, and they were talking his story, his version. But does anybody remember what he said? Oh, the big clubs are the people who have to be in charge of Europe, and now, well, Bern and Anas and somebody else are coming up and talking now about this from a. They say, no, 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 we're nothing to do with the others, they're saying, these new people from A22. But I've been working this business for many years, and all of us have been in this many years. We just don't believe anything now. What annoys me is that you know, people think we're naive, but I think there's a lot of toxic information from them. I think they're deceiving people. I think in, you know, in life you have to be very clear. You, know, you have to be clear about what you're saying. But people that are saying you're coming here to solve European Union football problems, well, it turns out that 40 clubs or 39 clubs in Spain are against that message and that they've all come to the assemblies. They've all come and talked about it. And in our assemblies, we have secret ballots. And, you know, so they've never won in the voting system. So it's the same message. And they are saying that they're going to solve the situation in Europe. So I think that they're intoxicating the whole situation. So this is why the League, La Liga is always wary of what's going on. You know, as when we can in La Liga, we will always be responding to everything that's mentioned about the European Sega League. And this is, I'm prepared to answer anything because whatever comes up in the press, 10 minutes later, I will be there because I think they're intoxicating the situation. And we will always respond to what is said. I've got another question from Italy. Marcos Acci from Calcio Finanza. Javier Tevez. You have used very firm words the last few days against Agnelli. What do you think is the, you know, what is the responsibility of the president of the Juventus apart from the Super League? One point, I think the responsibility will be defined by the courts. What I've read is that they've tried to win competitions. However, has taken the dredger to the situation where they are today, which is to try to false, uh, falsify their balance sheets and the information for shareholders. 
So, and they were not respecting the rules of the stock exchange in Italy. And so they are not abiding with the financial control. So Agnelli, Agnelli is going to be the leader of what is going to be the European Super League if he is presenting 45 balance sheets and if he is, you know, giving wrong information about the transfer of players, they're deceiving the people and they say that the UEFA are corrupt. Well, where's, where's the corrupt guy? So maybe he should look at his, you know, look at his own door, within his own door, instead of outside his home. If I think on Tuesday he was in the Italian Parliament, Mr. Agnelli, you know, even after he had resigned. So is he the right person to project, you know, to be talking about the A22 project when he was already resigned due to his um, problems that he's got with his own club? Good afternoon, Mr. President. This is, this is Christina from La Canegra. Do not think that competitions like the Premier League are a super league in themselves, and Spanish clubs like Real Madrid or Barcelona can't compete with them when you're about signing up players and also in broadcasting rights. So what does La Liga think about a solution to that is? Well, let me start at the end. I'm just going to give you a few facts and figures, and I've already explained, but so that you actually understand. If the money that the Spanish League distributes from the audio, you know, the broadcasting rather. So if we if we cross that with the amount of money that Premier had handed out into the English leave, so the excuse of Real Madrid and Barcelona is just not valid. The Premier's got other problems, which is something, well, it seems that we're against everybody, but there's the Premier League. We will compete with the Premier League obviously, because we want to get closer to the Premier League and try and get as much revenue as they have. But what happens in the Premier League? And we've seen it in this summer transfer market. It has become a league that makes, the, you know, has losses, not just Manchester City, but the majority of the clubs have important losses in the Premier League because they've got American owners, example. But there's two models in Europe. We have the German and the Spanish model. And we have, the losses are limited. They're not allowed to have high losses here in Spain. And that is the model that we should really work on and make sure that in, ensures that European football is sustainable. I think that is the model that we should all have because we don't want our competition to give, you know, to make lose losses. But it's not the Super League that's going to solve the fact that the Premier is, you know, their model gives losses. So I'm Madrid and Barcelona with the distribution in the broadcasting or rights in the year 2015 are highly competitive with the teams who play in the Premier League, but they're not competitive with them, with these, shall we say, the money that's put up by these owners or the funds who are buying or behind the Premier League clubs. But, well, look about PSG and Manchester City and all that. They have the, they like state. And they've made mistakes, I think, because they're state-backed. There's a question for the UK, Jimmy Gardner from the Press Association. The legal statutes of, vo sorry, I'm reading it in English and Spanish, so I have to, if the La Liga statutes don't allow the clubs to, take part in competitions that haven't been approved by the FIFA and the UEFA. He's also talking about if you're going to apply sanctions, but I think you already answered that part. No, today, no. Quick answer to that one. I think there's more questions here. Good afternoon, John McCargham. From in other countries, they don't talk about the Super League in the UK, for example. It's finished. But what is important is if La Liga feels supported by the other leagues, you know, the UK, Germany, France, because you know the Liga makes much more noise about this issue. Well, you're right. In other countries, the people don't speak so much about the European Sega League. But I think in the year 2021, when I spoke to the other leagues, in fact, before 
that weekend. You know, I before it was officially launched, I had already warned them what was going to happen. And I think we've talked a lot more here because we've got two or three clubs who were involved in the Super League. Um, you know, Real Madrid is one of the biggest clubs that's involved. So two, we have two out of the three major companies here, and they say live in Madrid and they're here. But, but we don't feel that supported. I would, in more colloquial terms, coll what I'm saying is colloquial, by the way, you know, I would have liked to get some um, help from the trenches.